International Labour Organization was born in 1919, from the ashes of World War I, in the belief that universal and lasting peace can be accomplished only if it is based on social justice. In 2017, its mandate was reinvigorated by the adoption of recommendation number 205, the world's only international normative framework for promoting peace and resilience in crisis through employment and decent work. But how can the world of work contribute to peace? By creating decent economic opportunities to increase the costs of violence, by bringing people together to break down horizontal divides, and by promoting social dialogue and labour rights to resolve grievances. First, employment and the income associated with it increases the opportunity cost of engaging in violence. When populations of working age have access to livelihoods and decent employment with adequate social protection, they may be less prone to violence. Second, if conflict is driven by negative perceptions and distrust among groups, decent employment programmes can promote social cohesion by increasing constructive contact between groups, joint enterprises and cooperatives with members from different communities, by creating opportunities for dialogue, including among the government, the workers and employers' organisations. These programmes can break down stereotypes and build mutual understanding and trust. Third, conflicts often relate to grievances arising from inequality, non-respect of human and labour rights, exclusion and perception of injustice. Sometimes it's not lack of work, but the experience of exploitative, precarious, informal work where fundamental rights are disregarded that spurs grievances. Inclusive and decent employment programmes that promote participation through social dialogue can reduce the risk of conflict by addressing grievances and making sure all voices are heard. When we tap into the transformative power of decent work to address the causes that drive conflict, we can build more peaceful and more inclusive societies. Decent work empowers people, brings them together, and gives them income, hope, and dignity. This is the path from fragility to resilience, from conflict to sustaining peace. It's my great pleasure to open this distinguished panel. My name is Martha Newton. I'm the Deputy Director General of Policy for the ILO. And we're proud to welcome you today to this digital series of 2021 Geneva Peace Week edition, co-organized by the ILO, the United Nations Peace Building Support Office, and the Geneva Graduate Institute's Center of Conflict Development and Peace Building. Today, we'll focus our discussion on an issue that is of fundamental importance to the ILO, the role of employers and workers' organizations and social dialogue in sustaining peace through decent work. Peace building has been a part and parcel of the ILO's mandate and work from our very origin. We were founded just over a century ago in the aftermath of the First World War by a peace treaty, the Treaty of Versailles, on the basis of the principle that universal and lasting peace can only be accomplished if it is based on social justice. The ILO is a unique organization due to its tripartite structure represented by governments, workers and employer organization based on a consensus that tripartism and social dialogue are essential if we want to contribute to long lasting peace and social justice. Various UN agendas, including the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Sustaining Peace Resolutions and the discussions around the humanitarian development peace nexus recognize the importance to work with non-traditional actors in the peace building sphere, including worker and employers organizations. Whilst it goes without saying that for the ILO, they are traditional actors and part of our constituency. Today's conflicts have serious implications for the world of work. Poverty, unemployment, and lack of decent work, working conditions can contribute to vulnerability and fragility 
creating a vicious downward spiral. And furthermore, we know that many of the countries that are dealing with protracted conflict, recurrent natural disasters and forced displacements, these are now facing the additional burden of COVID-19 that may also exacerbate existing drivers of conflict and social unrest and undermine trust and social contract between citizens, the private sector, and different states. In these settings, social partners are key actors in promoting good labor governance, which contributes to peace and stability and can boost economic and social progress. We strongly believe that the wider awareness on the unique and complementary role that social partners play in assisting enterprises and workers and contributing to achieving solutions and building social cohesion during times of crises would benefit not only ILO constituents, but also governments and other UN agencies and stakeholders leading the peace building space. Hence, this panel is an opportunity in line with ILO's recommendation 205, employment and decent work for peace and resilience. Adopted in 2017, it highlights that social dialogue, negotiations, consultations or exchange of information between or among, among representatives of governments, employers and worker organizations contribute to strengthen social and economic stability and sustainable peace and inclusive societies. We know that there won't be any sustainable development without peace and there's no peace without development. However, nobody can do it alone. And so we need to join forces because peace is everybody's business. Social partners have an inherent interest in peace, both for employers and workers organizations. It's critical to play a role in harnessing the stability and predictable business and work environments to protect livelihoods, business interests, interests, workers' rights, and especially our most vulnerable ones. Promoting freedom of association and social dialogue in conflict-affected situations enables valuable interchange and contributes to participative, democratic and political processes, inclusive societies, and good governance. The existence of strong and independent organizations of employers and workers have played a significant role in transitions to more democratic systems and sustainable peace in various countries. Furthermore, in order uh, to serve as an effective strategy for bridging various divides in societies, as well as humanitarian crisis response and longer term peace building and development, there must be consistent engagement with national and local labor institutions and with the private sector to ensure local ownership, enable national uh, policy support and break aid dependency. So tackling such problems can't be done without strong partnerships and strong social dialogue. With our UN partners, such as the Peace Building Support Office, with academics and research centers, such as the Center for Conflict Development and Peace Building, but also with our social partners, the employers and workers organizations. So I take the opportunity to thank the Geneva Peace Week in giving us an opportunity to highlight the cont contributions of decent work, workers and employers organizations, and social dialogue in sustaining peace. And let me leave you with this thought. With some words that were written more than 100 years ago, when the ILO's constitution was first drawn up. But in my personal view, they really could have been written about the world that we're living in today. It goes, whereas conditions of labor exist in involving such injustice, hardship, and privatization to large numbers of people, as to produce unrest so great that the peace and harmony of the world are imperiled and improvement of those conditions is urgently required. So all the best to Geneva Peace Week and I look forward to hearing this very interesting panel today. Thank you. Thank you ever so much to Martha Newton for, these, for this opening pitch and these welcoming remarks uh, for this panel. It's a great pleasure to um, say hello to everyone here on the panel, as well as to the audience. A uh, warm welcome from me, first of all. My name is Oliver Jutta Zornke from the Center on Conflict Development and Peacebuilding here at the Graduate Institute of International 
and Development Studies, one of the co-founders of the Geneva Peace Building Platform, which therefore also is the, um, the organizer of the Geneva Peace Week. Um, and it's a great pleasure to see everyone for this panel of the digital series of Geneva Peace Week 2021 entitled Sustaining Peace Through Decent Work, the Role of Social Partners and Social Dialogue. This particular panel is part of one of the four themes of this year's Geneva Peace Week, namely confronting inequalities and advancing inclusion, peace and SDG 16. So I'm very happy um, to be part of this joint panel together with the ILO and UNPBSO, the Peace Building Support Office in New York. And thank you again, first of all, to Martha Newton, the Deputy Director General for Policy of the ILO for giving us this opening pitch. Indeed, what we're going to try and do here in the next 30, 40 minutes is think through with our distinguished panelists on the key role of non-traditional actors, such as workers and employers organizations in sustaining peace and how they can also be mobilized to raise awareness amongst peace builders of the advantages of consulting and engaging social partner organizations, not least in order to generate comprehensive strategies to promote socioeconomic stability and resilience. Um, this is work that we also at the CCDP have been following quite closely, not least in collaboration with various bureaus and units of the International Labor, Labor Organization over the past years, and including um, through um, work on implementing recommendation 205, Martha Newton just made reference to it, one of the newest international labor standards on employment and decent work in, for peace and resilience, looking at situations of both conflicts and disasters. And this very much, I think, gives us a backdrop for the discussion here today. Um, without further ado, um, I would like to give the floor to our first of three panelists we have um, today, Hank Yang Brinkman, an old friend of the Geneva Peacebuilding Platform, um, who has been since 2010 the um, Chief of Peacebuilding Strategy and Partnerships at UNPBSO. As you know, PBSO is now part of UNDPPA in a restructured setup in New York, so the UN Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs. Um, Jan Henk, you have obviously lots and lots of experience um, to share also on this particular topic, and therefore as an opening pitch of, of a few minutes, it'd be great to hear your thoughts um, on how you see the participation of so-called non-traditional actors such as workers and employers' organizations in sustaining peace, and indeed also how social dialogue um, can be mobilized in the kind of peace building efforts that you and your colleagues are so much involved in. So without further ado, um, Henk Jan, thank you again for being part of this panel, and I'll give you the floor for the next five or seven minutes um, for your opening statement. Thank you very much. No, thank you so much, and thank you for inviting me. Um, really a pleasure to, to be uh, on this panel. <clears throat> Um, I don't think there really are traditional and non-traditional organizations, um, but uh, it, I really want to make uh, three points. Um, a conflict is inherent to all societies and all human interaction. Um, the issue is really of how to manage conflicts so that it doesn't escalate into violence. And I think the conflict um, inherently exists between workers and employers is really um, a very example. Um, the second I make is dialogue um, just coincidentally the secretary general yesterday council uh, in meeting actually on you, uh, Ethiopia said the dialogue is the foundation for peace um, it, the, the the third point I, I want to make um, is that institutions that provide a platforms for dialogue uh, are key so workers and employers organizations are important institutions or key institutions to provide platforms, not only for dialogue between workers and employees, but also within each of these organizations to uh, segments of society and bring, uh, bring them together and increase understanding uh, among these. So to, to go a little bit uh, deeper into this, um, we really have witnessed over the last few years um, a changing nature of violent conflict, and it's quite dramatic. Um, conflicts, uh, violent conflicts are uh, increasingly protracted and much more complex and involve a really large number of non-state armed actors that are often internationalized with foreign interference. There are linkages between terrorist group and organized crime, um, organized uh, crime um, that use terrorist tactics, 
uh, rebel group that used terror, uh, terrorist track, uh, tactics and used criminal um, behavior to finance themselves. And what we see is really a lot of small conflicts that have no front lines, no ba battlefields, no uniforms, uniforms, no uh, clear conflict zones, and often no distinctions between combatants and, and civilians. And that really has made um, the traditional tools of the, of the United Nations, um, such as peacekeeping and, and mediation, are much more difficult. At the same time, the world, um, the international community has spent $349 billion just on crisis management over a 10 year period. And I'm only counting UN peacekeeping, humanitarian official development assistance and ODA that is spent on refugees in donor countries. So we really need to switch from a crisis response to a more preventative approach. And I think dialogue in societies and social dialogue um, uh, is, is really a fundamental uh, foundation for that. Um, because the drivers have become much more multidimensional, going from political to environmental to um, economic uh, inequalities. Um, and if the drivers are multi, uh, multidimensional, the response also need to be multidimensional. And so we really need to look at a broader set of actors. Um, and that includes, again, uh, um, employees and, and workers organizations. Dialogue um, and inclusivities are re are, is really key in this, in this regard. Again, um, we know from research more inclusive uh, dialogues, more inclusive political and peace processes are more sustainable. And that is particularly the case when more women are included in these processes. Uh, exclusion is, is the single most important factor of why peace fails, as um, an academic Chuck Cole um, showed in his book, Why Peace Fails. And we really need to build coalitions of, of, of reform, reform. Um, it, and that includes a number of organizations across civil society. And again, employees and workers organizations can really play a very important role in that. Um, employers have um, been very important advocates for peace um, because peace is really a precondition for economic activity and development. Um, workers organizations have been part of social movements for a long time. Um, and um, the UN World Bank uh, study pathways for peace documented that um, nonviolent civil um, and social movement was a key factor in driving um, transitions uh, from authoritarian regimes to more democratic regimes and with more political and civil liberties um, in, in 50 out of 67 uh, cases in the period 1972 to 2005. So this building these coalitions beyond elites, including um, the various actors is really critical for, um, for reforms that might mean that the political elite um, loses either economic or, or, um, or political power. Um, and therefore more actors, more um, broader coalitions um, that is are inclusives, and that includes um, the possibility for dialogue among a very broad set of, of actors is really key to build more peaceful, just, and inclusive societies. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, uh, Henk Jan, for, for your statement. Indeed, everything you said resonates very much with, with also our thinking here at the CCDP and the work that we've been doing, um, not just on the definition of conflict and how we think about how violence affects us in multiple settings, but very much also in, in terms of how we have to perhaps rethink some of what it is we do in, in a prevention um, angle um, and very much always therefore building on social dialogue, building on social partners also to be able to, <laughs> to prevent and, and, and mitigate um, um, certain, certain, prevent certain crises even from, from starting or at least prevent some of their effects. Um, and I, I think this is something very much that, that echoes a lot of our discussions that are being had here. So thank you ever so much, and Ken, for that, um, for that opening um, statement. And I will now go to our second panelist, uh, Jacqueline Mugo. Hello there again, Jacqueline. 
um, nice, thank you for joining us as well from another part of the world, um, from Kenya. Um, Jacqueline uh, Mugo, she's the executive director of the Federation of Kenya Employers. She's also a titular board member of the ILO's governing body. Um, she's on the management board of the International Organization of Employers, and she is the Secretary General of Business Africa. And so I think with all these hats, uh, Jacqueline, that you have, um, you are very well placed to also um, give your thoughts on, on this topic, particularly on the way you think employers' organizations can be involved in building peace, in contributing to sustaining peace in conflict-affected settings. Um, and I'm wondering whether you could also give us a few instances from Kenya and elsewhere, from other countries you are familiar with, um, about how we can have some positive lessons or some practices that might be of relevance, not just to this discussion, but certainly um, also on the way we think about sustaining peace in the medium to long term. Jacqueline, thank you ever so much again for being on this panel, then over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oliver, for your kind introduction. And I really appreciate the invitation by Geneva Peace Week I extended to me on behalf of employers to talk about this important topic and highlight the role of employers and social partners in, uh, in social dialogue and to contribute to peace. As the speakers who went before me have said, conflict is the reality of our times. And as an African, we have seen conflict in many countries in our continent. There are frameworks for peace building at all levels, whether it's the international instrument we're talking about, Recommendation 205, which is a recent ILO instrument on employment and decent work in building peace and resist resilience. Here in Africa, we have frameworks at the AU level and at sub-regional level, but the reality is that conflict is still pretty much a part of our lives. And I want to make the first point that efforts at peace building really requires uh, social dialogue, uh, be it at political or social level, and it requires social dialogue with all parties, a broad cross-section of parties with the intention of finding some peace uh, in the conflict. Uh, the laying of a foundation of good governance is important. And at the end of the day, speaking now as an employer and uh, on behalf of business people, the stability in the socioeconomic environment is very important. So over time, employers, organizations, and social partners have had to get involved in the peace building efforts and in efforts to bring reconciliation because you cannot really divorce a business from the political climate and whether or not there is peace, because if there is no peace, then nothing else can happen in, in an economy. And there are many examples where employers' organizations have played a very critical role in finding solutions and also in efforts at building social cohesion. So employers' organizations, like other social partners, are really change catalysts for societal good at the end of the day. By the very nature of the work they do, they coordinate the behavior and the work done by enterprises to promote a good business, to create employment, and at the end of the day, to avail opportunities for people to work and ensure there's economic well being, which, in my view, engenders peace. So, the root causes of the lack of peace uh, are very important when you begin to talk about solutions and what it is that employers' organizations can do. Because the fact is that peace and well being is very closely tied to issues of equality of opportunity, to issues of decent work, to issues of fair treatment for all. So, employers' organizations, at the end of the day, are advocates for social justice. Some of the interventions that employers are doing and continue to do is really promoting economic recovery. We are talking now in the context of COVID 19. Economic recovery is needed for employment and for decent work opportunities and social economic integration and recovery. We are working on promoting sustainable employment and decent work, building social protection systems because COVID-19 has really exposed the soft underbelly of the developing world in that there is no social protection, at least by and large. Some countries have it, that, but the majority of countries do not. And this has made it very difficult to begin to talk about recovery. 
So what is the state of enterprises? That then becomes a very important advocacy issue for employers' organizations, because if you have sustainable enterprises, then you can retain people in jobs and not increase the inequality levels that we see. So the state of enterprises is a very important aspect of recovery and maintaining peace in economies as you look at the impact of uh, the pandemic on the SME sector and the large informal sector that we have in the developing world. Employers organizations on a daily basis provide guidance and support to their members to enable them to take effective measures to assess, identify, and mitigate uh, the risks of conflicts, the risks of the absence of peace, and the risks of pandemics such as the one that we have now. Building the capacity of enterprises to be able to play their role effectively in the economies where we operate, uh, therefore becomes very important. There is a role of contributing to the economic, social, and legal frameworks at the national level and at global level to encourage lasting and sustainable peace and also develop uh, respect for rights, uh, labor rights and human rights so that society can be cohesive. And um, the investment by employers organizations through their members in economies is huge. They are the owners of capital through their members. And it therefore becomes very important that you have stability in the economic environment. And the absence of that then means that uh, you have to invest a lot of work to be able to bring some element of recovery for the private sector to play its role. So you cannot divorce efforts at peace building from the normal work uh, that employers do. It's, it's very important. And as has been highlighted before, social dialogue is an integral part of this process. And employers and workers organizations on a daily basis use social dialogue to resolve issues, to negotiate collective bargaining agreements, to resolve disputes, whether it's inter-parties at their own level, whether it's uh, meetings chaired by the Ministry of, of Labor, or where you end up in court, in that, uh, in that whole spectrum of interventions, social dialogue becomes very important, and they can share this experience with other actors in the economy to embrace dialogue. And now I want to give some specific examples of what employers' organizations have done to try and inculcate a culture of social dialogue, even amongst the political class. Because here in Kenya, in the year 2007, we had a national conflict arising from elections. We had post-election violence. And so the loss of lives of very many people ended up in having a case at The Hague. And this pattern was repeated in the year 2013. So to change the, the texture and the quality of dialogue and electioneering, the Federation of Kenya Employers came up with a manifesto. And in this manifesto, we outlined the quality of a leader that we needed. We advocated for social dialogue. We advocated for issue-based electioneering and campaigning, as opposed to divisiveness on the basis of ethnicity uh, power struggles, because often this uh, electioneering campaigns boil down to personality issues as opposed to um, really looking at the issues. What is it that you're offering the electorate? What do you plan to do in terms of continuity of business? And this manifesto, we are repeating again because next year Kenya is going to elections and we are preparing a manifesto to engage the social class to ensure that they really embrace uh, the spirit of dialogue and discuss issues and present their campaign promises to the electorate so that we can make a choice. This idea of employers organizations preparing manifestos to dialogue with the political class has been repeated in many countries uh, based on the experience that Kenya had and, uh, and the examples we've seen of how conflict can go uh, to very huge extents to loss of lives and even genocide in some of the neighboring countries that we have. I want to cite examples of other countries where memorandums of understanding have been signed by employers and workers organizations, Kenya being one of them, to address the current situation of COVID-19 and the potential impact of uh, upheavals and conflict arising from people losing jobs and losing livelihoods. So many employers organizations and workers unions have entered into memorandums of understanding to provide a basis for addressing workplace conflicts, which has been replicated in, in other sectors 
of the economy to see if parties cannot work together really in a unique scenario where you have a pandemic which nobody expected and nobody can be blamed for. What can you do to accommodate workers? Can people work part-time? Can we reduce salaries? Can we do shared work? And these memorandums of understanding have provided a basis for containing conflicts and ensuring that we move together as we head towards maybe having enough numbers of people vaccinated so that we can avoid further job losses. Lessons that we have learned in terms of employers' organizations and our contribution to peace building is that it is very important to have open, transparent processes to resolve conflicts where there has been loss of life and where there has been genocide. People need platforms to ventilate and to be able to talk about what happened to them, what happened to their relatives, what happened to the jobs, so that there can be healing. Peace building requires participation of employers' organizations, of all other actors. We, no one can do it alone. And increasingly, we need to open up spaces for employers' organizations and business people to play this role alongside workers and other players so that together we can avoid a scenario where only one party and largely the political class is taking up that space and leaving out the rest of the actors. Because at the end of the day, it takes everyone to ensure that there is peace, there is continuity of work, so that we can heal the wounds that there have been and avoid a repeat of conflicts, possible genocide, but at the end of the day, create a society that is inclusive, that can create decent work for the good of society. I thank you. Thank you ever so much, uh, Jacqueline Mugo, for your for your statement. Um, uh, plenty for us to to, to think about and, and and reflect from from what you've said. Um, I'm particularly also happy that you mentioned COVID nineteen, and and I didn't think it, it is indeed a, a very important issue to 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 reflect upon how economic recovery um, has is often hampered by a lack of of social protection um, within a variety of sectors in the economy, and we see this now. Um, all over the place in, in all kinds of settings, be it developed or, or, or less developed countries. Um, and I'm very glad you brought that up, Jacqueline. And also, I think your, your own, obviously, your own country context, um, Kenya, is one that, that has received a lot of attention. Even we, um, over the years, have, have done research on um, precisely the topic of how both employers' organizations and also workers' organizations, now looking already ahead to our final panelists, were involved in 2007. Um, to jointly try and mitigate the violence that had broken out um, and indeed how together and with changes in the constitution and changes in a variety of, of other legislative reforms were able to, to therefore also prevent um, um, a similar um, constellation in the next round of elections in 2013. So I think there are, there are some lessons there that, that can certainly be, 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 be harnessed and, and it's, a, it's a context where where I think uh, uh, more work um, is certainly needed to also see that there is a there is certainly a potential for social dialogue to play its part in in these kind of contexts. So thank you very much again, Jacqueline, um, for the moment. And moving swiftly on to our last distinguished panelist, uh, Owen Tudor. Um, Owen, you've had a very long and distinguished career in trade union circles. There's much more on your bio than I'm able to say here at the moment. I should nonetheless say that you are at the International Trade Union Confederation, the ITUC, where you were um, elected to be Deputy General Secretary in 2018. Um, and uh, I very much welcome you also to this panel, Owen, and certainly ask a question that is obviously the parallel to what we asked Jacqueline earlier in terms of how you see the role of, in, of workers' organizations in building peace, sustaining peace in the long run. And indeed also, um, if you feel that there are any, any practices, good or bad, <laughs> that you feel um, are worth emphasizing at this particular juncture. So Owen, thank you ever so much again for being with us and the floor is yours. Thanks very much indeed, Oliver. And can I uh, uh, express my pleasure at being part of Geneva Peace Week on behalf of the International Trade Union Confederation. Uh, we have 200 million members around the world in 163 countries and territories. And sometimes uh, we emphasize the fact that those territories are sometimes conflict uh, affected uh, areas of the world. Uh, but we, we still very often have trade union members 
there. I don't think it can be said often enough uh, in our context that there can be no social justice, which is what we're mostly concerned with, without peace. And there also can be no peace without social justice. Um, I think it's, uh, I'll demonstrate that slightly, the, the role of social partnership in this by agreeing with an awful lot of what Jacqueline said, uh, just to demonstrate how social dialogue is integral to, um, to our experience. Um, the new social contract that we're looking for as the International Trade Union uh, Confederation, including, for instance, um, the uh, universal social protection, as Jacqueline mentioned, is a, is a key element of this, is, is key to peace. It's key to conflict prevention. It's key to conflict resolution. And it's key to the recovery from conflict and, and, and building, uh, building peace into the future. Now, Collective bargaining is part of the DNA of the trade union movement. Uh, we believe in negotiation uh, rather than conflict. Uh, we want social dialogue to be the way in which people achieve their objectives uh, rather than uh, resorting to, to arms. Um, and, and I think that's probably demonstrated best around the world in Sweden, which is uh, a country that almost nobody thinks of as anything other than the home of peace and stability, social justice, all that sort of stuff. But actually, it was social dialogue that made Sweden like that, because uh, the employers and unions in the interwar period in the 20s stared over the precipice into a country that was about to become riven by internal conflict, came together and created, as I say, what we now always consider as the byword uh, for social peace and social justice. So it's evidence that this really can have such a big effect that sometimes people no longer know that there was a conflict in the first place that, uh, that, that we can overcome. It, it's not always that successful. And I think we always have to have um, realistic objectives for what can be achieved. The role of trade unions, uh, workers, organisations, uh, is very often that we engage people not on the basis of their beliefs, not on the basis of uh, their ethnicity, uh, their age, their location, but actually simply on the basis that they go to work to earn a living. And we therefore transcend uh, in the best examples, all of the divisions which actually lead to uh, to conflict, which are which are sometimes the cause of conflict, sometimes exploited to um, to create conflict uh, by others. Uh, recommendation two hundred five of the International Labour Organization is absolutely key in spelling out the role that social justice, decent work, and social dialogue can play uh, in prevention. But there are other instruments as well, such as the much more recent recently adopted a convention on preventing violence at the workplace, which is uh, a key uh, convention for us at the moment. Uh, we have uh, put enormous efforts this year, uh, which is um, a, a, a special year uh, because it's the year that the treaty on the uh, prohibition of nuclear weapons has come into force uh, to make the case for common security as the solution uh, to conflict. Uh, we're interested in getting people made secure rather than nation states. Uh, we want to see common security and negotiation as the solution to problems rather than a renewed arms race. And that partly, our commitment to that partly comes out of the experiences of our Japanese uh, colleagues, our, our affiliates, who of course are the, the the only people who have ever had a nuclear weapon dropped on them, uh, and and they have always taken a leading role in promoting peace in our organisation. But there are examples from all over the world. I come from uh, Great Britain, uh, in Northern Ireland, the trade union movement and the employers' organisations were key forces um, to tell uh, the men of violence, and and it was sadly so often that the men of violence that they needed to put down their weapons and find peaceful ways to resolve their differences. In Nepal, uh, in Colombia, 
uh, in Sudan and Somalia, in Tunisia, where uh, employer and union organizations were actually part of the quartet that won the Nobel Peace Prize for the work that they did together to stabilize Tunisia after the uh, the revolution there to make sure that, that, that there was peace. As I say, What's going on in Tunisia at the moment demonstrates that there isn't a magic wand that uh, that social dialogue produces. It isn't a solution that works perfectly or works uh, forever, but it is a key element uh, of making sure that the world is a safer place in which people can earn their livings, go about their lives, raise their families and meet uh, their legitimate objectives. So social dialogue is absolutely crucial to trade unions, but it's also absolutely crucial to peace. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Owen Tudor, for your, for your words, which I can think I can uh, echo very well with, with the aims and objectives here of this panel, which are again to think through also the challenges of SDG 16, which is all about peaceful, just and inclusive societies. And I think that is certainly a discussion that one cannot have without the world of work, without workers and employers organizations at the table, um, certainly the ones that, that represent such a large proportion of society and are very much at the heart of how societies function. I'm also happy, Owen, that you, you brought up Sweden and <laughs> it goes a little bit back to, to the, a little bit, a few words that um, Henk Jan and I, when we had the beginning of this discussion in terms of how non-traditional are these actors really, because I think it just emphasizes that perhaps, yes, employers organizations, workers organizations are very much traditional actors in a sense who've been part and parcel of how our societies function. I think perhaps us as, as the peace building community, and I put myself and my colleagues a little bit into this camp as well, um, I think we've, we've had a tendency perhaps to overlook um, such um, societal partners in, in our efforts to understand how peace building functions in a variety of conflict and post-conflict settings. So I think there's very much an agenda there to pursue and, and one that my colleagues and I um, are, are also very much aware of. There's actually a dearth in the literature on the role of the world of work in building peace and sustaining peace. And I think there's much more that can be done in that direction. Um, thank you all to all three of you again for your, for your statements. Um, these digital series are intended to be short and concise, which also means that we're already very much at the end of this particular episode. Um, so what I would uh, encourage you each to do is if I can give you the floor for one more minute <laughs> to give us some concluding thoughts of, of what you took from this discussion, what you think we haven't covered and should be discussing more in future uh, conversations um, that I think would be a nice way to, um, to round off this particular um, uh, hour here. Um, and Owen, to give you a little bit of a breather, I'm going to go in the same order again as before. Um, so um, Henk Jan, please, would you like to take the floor and then we'll go through the three panelists one more time. Very briefly, please, just 60 seconds of some concluding food for thought. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks so much. And, and really interesting to listen to uh, both Jacqueline and, and Owen uh, as well. Um, I think my parting toward, uh, thought would be um, uh, everybody can build peace um, and everybody in the workplace, in your social interactions, in your political interactions, it's really important what kind of language you use and what kind of um, attitude um, and respect and dignity you provide to your, um, uh, to our, your our fellow uh, are human beings. Um, and so that applies uh, uh, to all societies and, and all organizations and all institutions. Thank you very much. Thank you ever so much, uh, Henk Jan Brinkman from UNPBSO. Over to Jacqueline Mugo. That is that we need all hands on deck and employers' organizations have a cr critical role to play in peace building and we really need to interro interrogate existing peace building frameworks and the approaches that we've used traditionally and allow other actors such as employers organizations and workers to play that role based on their experience in social dialogue and work that they do on a daily basis to reach agreement through negotiations, accommodation and consultations as opposed to contention. Thank you very much Jacqueline Mugo for those for those words, indeed, words to keep in mind as we move forward. And thank you again, Jacqueline, from the Federation of Kenyan Employers 
and to having been on this panel. And then finally, Owen Tudor from the ITUC, back over to you. So Oliver, it's rare that uh, trade unions, uh, and I'm sure this goes for employers as well, are accused of being untraditional. Uh, we we are sometimes burdened by the weight of tradition. But I want to give one more example, uh, as, and finally, to, to issue a challenge to not so much the peace community, because because we have uh, so many alliances there and so many connections, but to but to nation states and governments and politicians. Uh, I was a part of a trade union delegation to Iraq. Uh, just after the invasion in 2003 that toppled uh, Saddam Hussein. And uh, we met as a trade union delegation, representatives both of Iraqi employers and trade unions to talk to them about the role that they could play together in recreating democracy, civil society, and an economy uh, in war-torn Iraq. And it is a crying shame that they weren't engaged and that Iraq then descended back into, into violence. Uh, I say to politicians, when you're dealing with either uh, conflict prevention or conflict resolution, remember to engage with unions and employers. Do not think that you can create uh, a new state without those crucial elements of civil society. Well, thank you very much again, Owen Tudor, for your final words of wisdom to <laughs> close this panel. Um, I will not try and um, add anything to what it is you just said. Um, I certainly learned a lot from all three panelists, and I'm sure the audience did as well. Um, this is an important subject that we need to continue to uh, have and to pursue both here at the Geneva Peace Week and a variety of other digital and face-to-face and, um, -face events that are being um, held here at this particular juncture, but certainly also uh, through all the variety of collaborative um, initiatives that are ongoing with the ILO, with PBSO, with workers and employers organizations. Um, and I certainly am very happy to continue and pursue these discussions um, with you all and thank, first of all, the panelists again, as well as our audience for being part of this discussion here today and wishing you all a fruitful and engaging Geneva Peace Week 2021. Thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Uh, happy to be with you uh, this uh, evening. Uh, in terms of uh, why social uh, dialogue is important uh, for peace, I just uh, want to highlight a few points. First of all, it's the question of transparencies in communication. Uh, quite often, conflict is bred as a result of misinformation or the lack of it. Uh, so social dialogue enables the employers and the workers to close that gap. Secondly, is the question of accountability uh, so that businesses, employers are held accountable for their action. So social dialogue provides that room uh, for other dissenting voices, whether they be community members or employees, to voice out their concerns and to hold the employers accountable. And that uh, helps us to prevent uh, conflict. And of course, more broadly, is the issue of responsible business conduct. As a result of uh, social dialogue, employers tend to look beyond just their companies to include their uh, supply chain. And this can be uh, on social uh, issues, for instance, like child labor, issues of forced labor as well, to ensure that they are not complicit in those uh, kind of uh, uh, behaviors which basically are unacceptable in the business world. Uh, also, uh, from uh, the broader view, uh, from the nationwide kind of perspective, is what is recommended by the, the tripartite. So in Uganda, we have the tripartite charter, and the tripartite charter envisage uh, social dialogue as a tool for preventing conflict in the workplace, but also uh, beyond the workplace. The other is, of course, us working as uh, a tripartite. We have 
taken social dialogue even to refugee hosting communities as well, and then among refugees uh, uh, themselves as well. So as uh, a, a tripartite, we are working also at the national level in various uh, regions of the country where there are, uh, there are conflicts, and then to get to engage with those communities, to engage with the host communities, to engage with the refugee communities, to see what kind of businesses uh, might be established. Uh, usually violence and conflict is a product of unemployment, a product of lack of what to do. So people are just basically trying to survive. Or the communities might see uh, the refugees as a threat to their own livelihoods. But when the opportunities are broadened, then it's it, the likelihood of conflicts uh, are even lessened, if anything, uh, the refugees are seen as opportunities that they're bringing more into the community. So we are currently working on that. At the Federation, we are organizing investor roundtables to try and take uh, investors into these communities uh, with refugees so that we can even expand the opportunities uh, available for them. And of course, uh, also at the national level, uh, social dialogue enables us to do what we uh, preach. Basically, we say no one should be left behind. And the dialogue forums that we, we all allows everybody to put out their voice, uh, where the constraints are, where they see the opportunities and what manner of support they might need, either from the government or from uh, the, the, the businesses. Now, uh, the second question you, you raise uh, is about what are some of the emerging uh, good practices? I think some of the emerging good practices is that the flexibility of employers to negotiate when there is an immediate crisis. And in our case, uh, COVID-19. It's uh, the odd fixed year periods for negotiations. But when the uh, pandemic struck immediately, no one even resisted that we had agreed already for a two year period, so we can't negotiate again. Uh, people came on the table, they did negotiation, and I think made the, the resolving the issues a lot easier. It would have been very difficult uh, for companies if these uh, negotiations uh, had not been done. So it has also improved uh, a lot, as, as you can see uh, during this period, the trust. The, the level of trust among the partners, uh, the, the workers and the employers, trusting that whatever the employer is doing is in the best interest of everyone, not just for the business, but the employees as well. In, in other words, the employer is working to save the jobs. Hello, I'm Aline Valérie Bono. I'm the director executive of Groupement interpatronal du Cameroun, qui est donc l'organisation euh, des employeurs la plus représentative du Cameroun. Et donc, euh, alors, comment le dialogue social peut jouer un rôle clé dans le maintien de la paix? Écoutez, euh, le dialogue social, à mon sens, c'est la, la, la chose la plus importante euh, qu'il faut pour maintenir la paix. Et la crise que nous traversons actuellement là, avec la pandémie du, du COVID-19, a permis euh, malheureusement de creuser les inégalités qui existaient déjà entre, euh, entre les couches sociales. Et en général, euh, on devrait euh, ne pas perdre de vue que le, le, comment dire, la plupart des, des, des mouvements sociaux sont créés ou alors partent en général de l'entreprise, du sein de l'entreprise. Alors, le dialogue social, donc, il, faut le, il faut le subdiviser déjà en dialogue bipartite employeur-employé qui permet donc de pouvoir contenir un certain nombre de, 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 de mouvements sociaux, soit en devenir, soit en création, soit en gestation. Et euh, donc, à cause de la crise, comme je le disais, on a été obligé, plusieurs entreprises ont été obligées de mettre en chômage technique de manière massive. La, la, la reprise économique vigoureuse que le monde a, que le monde a, a connue après l'après-crise la, a créé malheureusement euh, une augmentation des, 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 des coûts des matières premières, du fret qui est passé de, de, de 0 à 400 euh, et puis malheureusement une diminution du pouvoir d'achat. Alors, c'est ce dialogue social donc, 
entre employeurs et employés qui permet, euh, avec, sous le chapeau des organisations patronales, euh, donc pour le cas du JICAM, qui a permis de faire comprendre aux employés que euh, non seulement le mouvement était mondial, le mouvement n'avait rien de camerounais, mais qu'il fallait euh, pouvoir négocier pour pouvoir garder euh, une certaine paix au sein de l'entreprise euh, pour que ça ne puisse pas sortir de l'entreprise pour aller vers l'extérieur. Alors au Cameroun, on a eu un mauvais... Euh, euh, en 2008, on a eu ce qu'on a appelé les émeutes de la faim, qui sont partis malheureusement de, de la diminution du pouvoir d'achat des travailleurs et qui ont fait euh, un tel mouvement euh, qui, était, qui s'est transformé en mouvement national. Et il est question de ne plus reproduire ça. Et pour donc euh, contenir ces, 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 ces mouvements-là qui peuvent partir de l'entreprise pour se retrouver à l'extérieur, le patronat donc prend sa part. Et euh, nous avons eu à faire des actions euh, assez fortes pour maintenir la paix. Nous avons, dans le cadre de, de, de la reconstruction des régions du, du nord-ouest et du sud-ouest du Cameroun, nous avons reçu euh, le premier ministre en mai avec tout le secteur privé pour pouvoir voir comment est-ce que le secteur privé pouvait contribuer dans la reconstruction de ces zones qui sont en, en guerre pour pouvoir maintenir une certaine paix. Parce que, pour, euh, comment dire, euh, la... la, la, la l'insécurité qui règne dans ces zones qui sont en proie à une crise face à des sécessionnistes sont également entretenues par l'employabilité qui a diminué du fait de la sortie de la majorité des entreprises. Nous avons des entreprises qui sont spécialisées dans l'import, l'importation des produits comme la banane, des produits comme l'huile de palme, qui sont comment dire, dans ces régions-là et qui ne pouvaient plus employer des centaines et des milliers de personnes donc, le maintien de la paix de ces régions commence par la reprise de, 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 ces, de ces travailleurs dans les, dans les champs, dans les plantations, qui permettront donc de pouvoir recommencer les importations de ces produits-là et de pouvoir relancer l'économie. Donc, alors, pour pouvoir donc mettre tout ça en musique, le, le patronat, donc le GICAM, a dû euh, s'impliquer de manière, euh, euh, comment dire, vigoureuse financière en, 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 en demandant aux, à, ses, à ses membres de pouvoir faire des contributions financières dans le plan de reconstruction de, de, qui est donc un plan de reconstruction euh, présidentielle qui est euh, appuyé par le, une organisation des Nations Unies comme le PNUD, donc de pouvoir donc s'impliquer pour pouvoir relancer l'économie dans ces régions-là. Donc, alors, le rôle de la, de, du dialogue social qui peut être bipartite, employeur, employé, ou alors tripartite, employé, gouvernement et travailleur, permet euh, vraiment, en un point douté, de pouvoir maintenir la paix et, et de pouvoir maintenir la cohésion sociale. My name is Omar Farouk Osman. I am the General Secretary of the Federation of Somali Trade Unionists. From our own experience as a country that went through 30 years of civil war, our people have endured several conflicts, which were bloody, which were causing a lot of damages, a lot of displacements, and brought a lot of destructions. But as trade unionists, as organizations that represent workers, we have experienced that social dialogue is the best way to promote social harmony and social peace in our society. And that has been our own approach of dealing with conflicts. Social dialogue has been the means that we have been using in promoting peace in our own society, in promoting a dialogue with not only the employers and the government, but also with other actors in our society, in the com different communities. Because we strongly believe that There can be no peace without dialogue. There can be no peace without all of the actors of the conflict coming together and having interactive discussions or interactive dialogue on the ways to improve their own society and overcome difficulties. One very good example is we believe that 
in our own way, there is a Somali saying which says, they, let us talk meanies, let's make peace. And that is exactly what we have been uh, pursuing. And the only way that we have been pursuing that is through social dialogue. And that has resulted for people to come together to engage in conflict resolution. That's why our trade union movement is actively engaged in peace building and in promoting stability in all regions of Somalia through social dialogue. That's why workers are playing a great role in conflict resolution and peace building efforts in Somalia. And our the, the center of our own engagement is, is social dialogue. It is not only for workers employers and government to engage through social dialogue, but the wider Somali society. When it comes to the best example that we can give as a country with regard to social dialogue, social dialogue has been very instrumental in rebuilding the trust between the trade unionists, employers and government. It has reduced it the conflict is. It has allowed for all of us to come together around the one table, to have franker discussions, to engage in the spirit of tripartism. That has resulted for us to rebuild the trust, to engage in a constructive manner. And finally, for the first time in the history, that kind of trust building through social dialogue has enabled us to establish the Somali National Tripartite Consultative Council, which is for the first time established in Somalia. Thank you to the engagements that we have done, but the best method that we have used to rebuild the trust, to resolve our conflict is not only in the labor market, but also in our own society and engage actively was the engagement through social dialogue. And now that the, the, the SNTCC, which is the formal uh, dialogue body that we engage actively has enabled us that we can be partners of progress. We can be different on our own way because we are different in the interests that we defend as workers, employers, and government. But at the same time, we can engage in the spirit of social dialogue, and that has been successful for the past four years. We are very happy where it is now, and we wanted to build on that so that uh, we can take it to higher heights and make sure that social dialogue is effectively used, not only in the labor market, but also in our own communities.